Hi guys, it is a stormy night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in early March of 2020 here in Austin, Texas. And my name is Sam Mitchell and you have stumbled into Collapse Chronicles where this week I have, for the second time, uh, I have the great pleasure within a week, we're going to see if global industrial civilization can stay with us for the next 45 minutes to an hour, where it is my great pleasure to bring on to the show economist John Quiggin from Australia. We're going to go all the way down to Australia and have a lively conversation with John and I've read some of John's stuff, so you might recognize his name, but if you do not, John Quiggin is an Australian economist, a professor at the University of Queensland. He was formerly an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and a member of the Board of the Climate Change Authority of the Australian Government. Uh, Quiggin completed his undergraduate studies at the Australian National University, graduating with a BA in Math and a Bachelor of Economics with the University Medal and the Economic Society Prize. He then completed a Master of Economics through coursework at the Australian National University and th th this man is an educated man. He knows what he talks of, what he speaks of, shall we say. Uh, John has been at the University of Queensland since 2003, being an Australian Research Council professional, professorial fellow and federation fellow, and a professor in the School of Economics and the School of Political Science and International studies. And I could go on. If I started listing this man's awards, I would be here for an hour. But I'm ready to get into this conversation to find out where the economy, the global economy is headed in the near future, uh, according to this man. So John Quiggin, come on to Collapse Chronicles, say hi to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this. Hi, everybody. Okay, well, that was quick and uh, quick, quick and easy. So, uh, John, even even before I found your work uh, before the infamous coronavirus uh, ever reared its head, I uh, and was was contacting you before we were even hearing about this. And this sounds like uh, right out of the playbook uh, in some ways that that you have been predicting that the uh, that the global industrial economy was looking for an excuse to uh, have a shall we say correction uh, talk about that and before we get into whether you believe the coronavirus will spell doom for the global industrial economy what were what had when you say that the global industrial economy is is looking for a correction, educate us a little bit on that. Well, yeah, well, I suppose, I mean, I, I should say before the coronavirus, of course, we had um, climate change and all through the last six months, you know, Australia has had these catastrophic bushfires, which um, only, only the rain just fell at the end of February, so we had about a week when we could catch our breath before the coronavirus came along. So um, so that was all pretty depressing. But I'm um, of, of the view that... Ever since the global financial crisis, we've been pottering along with these very low interest rates, uh, no fundamental change in a system that clearly uh, clearly has fundamental flaws in it. And I think we're waiting for something to uh, – waiting for some event that will uh, show us we, what, in, what in that economy is sustainable and what isn't. It may well be that the, um, uh, that the coronavirus will prove to be that event. Okay, so uh, when you say m very well may be, I, there was a big article in the uh, New York Times yesterday, which I'm quite sure you're familiar with, where the New York Times was, I guess, interviewing several economists to try to answer the question, could the coronavirus cause a recession and how? 
Uh, so pretend like uh, you're actually talking to the New York Times, but you're talking to Sam Mitchell, and I am asking you the question, could the coronavirus cause a recession, and how? How would you answer that question? Well, I'd start by looking at China, and there's two things about China. One is that they've uh, introduced drastic measures to control the spread of the virus. That's almost certainly created a recession, negative growth yeah, in China, at least, uh, uh, at least for this first quarter of the year. Uh, and it's likely that those disruptions are going to continue for some time. Uh, the good news is that, um, as far as we can tell, those measures seem to have worked. So that says two things about the rest of the world. One is we've so far only got one model of how to stop this virus killing lots of people, and that's the Chinese model. They're the only country who successfully contained it. They've done so essentially by bringing about a recession, by telling people, look, just don't come to work, stay home. Uh, if you're visiting your relatives in another part of the country, just stay there, don't come back. So if that response is adopted, as it has, for example, to a certain extent in limited parts of Italy, uh, then we'll have a recession more or less automatically. Um, and the second point is that uh, a recession in China is obviously going to have big impacts uh, uh, all around the world. Lots of stuff made in China. We're already seeing companies like Apple saying uh, they're going to have trouble getting the parts they need from the global supply chain, which has become... Uh, very complex and, and very vulnerable. So there's, uh, there is also that flow-in effect. So that's the China story. The other thing that could happen is that uh, we don't do very much, as, as the US certainly and Australia uh, possibly doing a little bit more. The US so far doing very little in terms of uh, active measures to control the spread of the virus, uh, that the virus gets away and, and creates very large-scale infection. And, of course, in that case... Uh, in that case, we almost certainly would have a recession simply by people getting sick and staying home from work. So, so narrowing in on the coronavirus, that's... Uh, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what it would take for this to cross a tipping point. I mean, right now, I mean, the stock market, what, fell 13% last mm. year. Obviously, airlines are, are going to take a hit, the cruise ship industry. Uh, I, I, the, the direct economic interest, you know, directly affected by this, seemed to me to be fairly limited it's uh you know what i'm saying that that are going to take a direct kick in the butt from this is so yeah. it, 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 limited but probably enough you know and enough to cause a reset you know if we if we take you know, commonly used definition of recession as two quarters of negative growth there's probably enough there to do that i mean that's not you know, that's not how a recession is best defined, maybe, but there's enough. If you have a 20% hit to those industries, that knocks something like 1% or 2% off, off GDP. Now, that's enough, to, um, that's enough to wipe out economic growth for two quarters. Uh, add to that a stock market shock that means people are looking at their retirement accounts and their investment accounts and saying, gee, I'm not as well off as I was. I better uh, not, uh, not spend money on, on that new TV set or on the... Uh, on going out to dinner, uh, you could easily get that kind of um, that kind of recession. It still wouldn't be huge, as you suggest. It's still the large parts of the economy would still be going on, uh, but there'd be enough to um, enough to derail the very slow recovery we've seen ever since the global financial crisis, at least uh, at least while the virus runs its course. Uh, I suppose the the bigger question which we'll see is whether, uh, as I'm saying, you know, when the t- as out, you see who isn't wearing their, their bathing trunks. Uh, um, uh, this kind of shock uh, will show uh, who has taken on debt that can't really be sustained, things like that. And so, um, uh, so we're certainly seeing uh, in the Chinese economy uh, uh, where, where the shock's been very severe that uh, we, we're already seeing evidence of large-scale bankruptcies of, of small firms which can't get access to credit. I suspect unless there's a, a more drastic intervention that state-owned enterprises at the provincial level, which have taken on lots and lots of debt, uh, will find themselves in very severe trouble and that we'll see, uh, see those kinds of flow-ons in China. Uh, I think we'll find also that you know, lots of people, lots of businesses in the US have, um, 
have been um, overextending in terms of debt and may find uh, that a shock of this kind will be damaging to them. So uh, do you are, are you hearing any evidence at this point of, of like any serious interruptions in supply chains? I mean, so much stuff is made in mm. China. At, at what point are we going to head to Walmart and start finding the shelves empty because so little stuff is being made in China? I mean, is it actually going to show up on on the shelves of, of, of stores in the U.S. and Europe and Australia, do you think? That's a good question. I mean, Australia, I don't know if you saw this, had a huge run on toilet paper for no obvious reason. I mean, I mean it's not a gastroenteritis. There's no obvious reason why... Why toilet paper, except it's big and bulky, and so uh, the stores don't keep very big stocks of it, I guess. So a tiny bit of panic buying produced empty shelves, which produced more panic buying. I think now that's been laughed out of existence. But uh, I myself am thinking about, I was thinking about buying a TV set, and now I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if there will be TV sets uh, uh, still in stock. Better go down and take a look and, and maybe... Um, uh, rush out and get that. So we really, I don't think we know beyond the very limited statements we've had come from companies like Apple, which are certainly saying uh, this is going to be a problem for us. Um, and we don't know, of course, um, uh, you know, this is going to extend now to uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, other places. Um, uh, so that, so it's hard to imagine there won't be significant disruptions in those supply chains. What we don't know, again, is how... Um, how vulnerable they are and how much things like the trade war have stretched them, whether uh, whether that's already made those, those supply chains more vulnerable than they otherwise would be. And, uh, I mean, I would expect for for those items that, that do start uh, showing up in short supply that you can expect the price to rise, at, at least temporarily, till this thing sorts itself <clears throat> out. Yeah, so I mean, we could see all sorts of actions, and of course, you know, then there's the issue, as I say, there's the issue of whether people start panic buying and so forth. Obviously, there's a short run stimulus from panic buying, so it's in that sense the economy starts a little bit better, but, um, uh, but you could easily have a lot of disruption taking place. Um, and um, uh, you know, it is really just very difficult uh, to tell, and depends partly on uh, how, um, how strong you saw the economy. Uh, in the first place, certainly in Australia, the economy was already slowing down uh, before this crisis, and, and uh, that's after a very, very long period of expansion here, more than 20 years. Um, and so I think most people here are now expecting between the um, uh, between the, this virus and the effect of the bushfires, which uh, was devastating but not really going, not doesn't affect GDP very much as it's measured, but nonetheless I think... Uh, we're expecting to see uh, some kind of recession here in the next year or so. Yeah, because you, you got the double whammy of the of, mm. of the fires and, and and now this. So it sounds like you are predicting certainly a recession, which you said the official definition is negative growth for two quarters. Well, it's not official, but it's widely used, and 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 so that's sort of um, that's sort of a convenient. I mean, the good thing about it is you can measure it pretty quickly because uh, the statistics come out a few weeks after the end of the quarter, so it's pretty easy to check whether it's happened. Whereas uh, the official definition actually is put out by the National Bureau of Economic Research. They have a in the US they have a business cycles committee which says these things, but they typically don't announce a recession until at least six months or a year after it started. So. Uh, so people have seized on this two quarters of negative growth idea as a way of uh, giving a, a very quick and dirty measure of where the recession is taking place. Okay. Now, as you, you may or may not know, obviously there are plenty of YouTube channels, and, and I am not one uh, at this point, you know, just, just predicting absolute uh, catastrophic uh, crash and burn of the global and, uh, and economy of, from coronavirus. How far are you willing to go out on a limb in your in in your guesswork on how far this could go potentially? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I suppose I you know, I try and avoid being over the top. I was one of the 
big sceptics about Y2K. A lot of people were predicting um, disaster then, and I was I was pretty confidently saying, look, nothing much will happen here. I think coronavirus is already and will be a bigger deal than Y2K, but I, I doubt that it will be... I doubt it will be as big as the global financial crisis. Um, uh, I think uh, that's a convenient measure of the biggest shock we've had. There was much more, much more bad lending going on, much more, much more built-up problems in the economy then than there are now. So, so um, I think it it, uh, it will you know, derail the recovery um, that we've you know, that's been going on since the GFC. Uh, but um, I don't think it's big enough. And, and I mean. You know, being hard nosed about it, you know, the, you know, the, one of the features of this virus, unlike say the nineteen uh, nineteen pandemic, is it seems mostly to uh, kill old and sick people. Which I mean is is no comfort if you have old and sick relatives, but um, or if you're old and sick yourself. But <laughs> obviously means that um, obviously means that in terms of a loss of productive capacity, we're really not going to see. Yeah, you know, we're not going to see uh, lots of places where the workers are all. Uh, unable to work because they're, they're sick and, and died from this virus. So I see it as a, a significant shock, but not a uh, not anything that in itself is going to precipitate the end of industrial civilization. Okay, well, I I, I agree with you uh, 100% for, for what that's worth. I mean, I, I'm not an, I, I'm certainly not an economist. I am a long way from an economist. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but okay, let's turn the clock back. I uh, think let, let's look at a little bit bigger picture than uh, coronavirus. Now, e- even before this came along, uh, you have been, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I won't use the word alarmist at all, but, but you at least have the courage to go against the grain of a lot of uh, economists. So e- even before the coronavirus what were what were your main things that that you were the clouds on the horizon that you were seeing that you do not think some of your colleagues are are being uh, completely honest about well um uh, it's indeed not clouds on the horizon in Australia literal clouds of smoke through the cities from from yeah, climate yeah, change for, fight. Um, uh, you don't have to look at the horizon. Um, Brisbane, where I live, I, I guess it mostly was at the horizon level, but when I visited Sydney and Canberra, you were uh, coughing through clouds of smoke, just going to and from uh, going to and from your uh, hotel to, to wherever you're going in town, uh, staying inside as much as you could because to avoid that. So uh, all of that's a long and short way of saying climate change is, is, is uh, the big threat I see. I will say, I mean, it's it's the majority of the economics profession is actually reasonably good on this topic, but it's the um, it's the people who aren't, I guess, who are, are are making the big noises, and and the people who play economists on TV, for example, uh, have tend to play this down. So um, uh, so um, I, I think climate change uh, really represents uh, a huge threat. Um, uh, to, our, to our whole way of life, uh, to natural ecosystems in particular, but um, uh, I think one of the effects of the last bushfire season has been to change the conversation in Australia from uh, what should we do, what kind of planet are we leaving to, to our grandchildren, to um, uh, how are we going to get through this, how are we going to get through next summer. Um, so uh, climate change in Australia is already here, and I think, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, while there's a lot of alarm at the public level, the government is is and you know, the, the political leaders are worse than ever on the topic and can absolutely hooked on coal. So, so spell it out for me. Uh, what, how is how and when is uh, the, the, this generic term climate change, which is such a, an umbrella term for so many things, how do you see this playing out? I, I mean, what, what, what I keep pointing out and, and getting a lot of criticism from my listeners, by, by the way, is that I think the coronavirus is, is kind of a wake-up call mm. to, to what's coming that if if 
What is going on in the global economy and just the, the fear factor uh, from something what I consider as inconsequential as, uh, as uh, the, the, the coronavirus, when it really becomes apparent, when no, you know, when there's no way to deny uh, that 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 climate change is is here and it's real and it's only going to get worse. If this is the effect on the economy from the coronavirus, you see what I'm saying. What what's going to happen really when the masses understand that there's a lot bigger things uh, unfolding on this planet than the coronavirus that we need to be paying attention to? What's it going to look like in the global industrial economy? Well, certainly, I think we'll see. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of underlying fear and depression just going along in Australian life that just wasn't there before after this season. The coronavirus just rolls along. I think think there's there is. Um, you know, it's hard to see how that plays out, but it certainly saps at the kind of general confidence that uh, a market economy requires to keep going. I think. Um, I think it's, um, you know, I, don't, I mean, obviously to some extent I'm projecting, but you see this kind of commentary. We don't, you know, we know it's happening. I have this feeling of helplessness, uh, a near complete loss of faith, I think, in our political leadership. Um, you now, that could change if we had the right kinds of leaders, but uh, but certainly I think the uh, uh, the degree of faith that our current lead, in our current leaders is almost zero, and, and that reflects that when something like coronavirus comes along, yeah, we don't think, well, look, yeah, we've got a government that handles this kind of thing. We think, yeah, these are people who, you know, to use the Australian expression, wouldn't know if their ass was on fire. I mean, they really have gone through these catastrophic fires without learning anything. And and so I think um, I think that's going to have mean that confidence is a great deal more fragile than it was. That in turn affects both consumption and investment. And, and that can produce, I think, um, a much more chronic kind of feeling of, of depression uh, we we'll, we'll have coronavirus that will that will come and go, but there'll be something else probably in two or three years' time uh, that depresses us even more. Now you you talk about a term called black swan events. Is coronavirus yeah. a, a black swan? What is a black swan? Yeah. Explain that whole concept uh, to us. What and sure. what they are and what they could mean out of nowhere sure. for the economy. Sure. Well, as uh, your listeners live in the Northern Hemisphere, they will mostly have seen white swans. And um, for a long while, everybody assumed it was kind of a, a standard thing in logic text, all swans are white. And uh, uh, But um, when people came to Australia, when Europeans came to Australia, uh, they found swans who were black. Uh, all the swans here in Australia are black. And so finding uh, a black swan is something you haven't planned for, don't expect, in short, a surprise. Uh and um, and that's that's something which um, uh, that's something which can uh, in, in many ways the more complex the economy the more complexly structured the financial system the more vulnerable it is to black swans of, the, of various kinds and so so we saw that with the global financial crisis that the financial markets simply hadn't allowed the idea that all the housing markets in the US could decline at once they produced a whole lot of very elaborate financial products which essentially used the gains in one market will offset the losses in another on the assumption where you'd never have just losses. And when that did happen, uh, we had this disaster. So a pandemic like this, uh, in a sense, of course, it's not a complete um, black swan, A, because we've had them before, the um, influenza of 1919, to some extent, you know, a large one back in 1957, and B, because we had a series of warnings um, uh, from SARS and um, uh, Ebola and so forth that this could happen. Uh, but in practice, uh, uh, none of the lessons of those things were uh, were learned adequately, and so um, and so this has come as a shock that people have made huge um, uh, people have made uh, 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 huge investments in, for example, these global financial ch global uh, production chains, which are now vulnerable to disruption. Uh, we've got uh, uh, got this shock coming out that um, that I, yeah, ripples through the economy in unexpected ways.
And do you fully expect to see a bigger flock of black swans flying as uh, from from this point forward? I mean, it, you know, things are so yeah. crazy now. They're so chaotic. I, I mean, yeah. one, one could show up tomorrow, a whole nother one out of left field. Well, certainly um, you know, one thing, I mean, I've, I've talked about those kind of things, but the developments in the political sphere, the rise, so I was certainly caught by this very badly, the rise of sort of quasi dictators like Putin and uh, Modi and Trump um, from a situation where politics has Bolsonaro. become very bland and boring. Yeah. That sort of um, uh, that sort of came out of nowhere and obviously obviously creates the potential for all sorts of eruptions. You know, Erdogan and Putin get war tomorrow for all we know in Turkey and Russia. And, and, and that would uh, cer certainly take a hit on the uh, on the global industrial economy for sure. Um, yeah. Let me ask you, th this is just something that, I, that I've been talking about. I don't know if this applies in Australia or not. What I've been talking about for years, and, and, and it always just falls flat, I never get any comments when I mention this. I guess, see, I, I have a background in, real, in, in both journalism and real estate. And I am presently selling a a house on literally right now. I'm getting ready on Saturday to put my house on a floodplain in Texas up on the market. Now, the way it yep. works in the U.S. is is the flood insurance is underwritten mm. by the federal government. So I'm aware of that, yes. And there's, I mean, there's probably, I don't know, if you added up every single coastal property in line for sea level rise, uh, you know, properties and floodplains. And in Harvey, it wasn't even floodplains. And you add up all of that, and if, if, if the federal government ever stops underwriting insurance policies on, on coastal and floodplain properties, if the, if, if the feds pull out and lenders suddenly stop lending on, uh, on on all of this real estate I, I see that alone as as uh, sending the as making what happened in 2008 a bad hair day am I overreacting to that or, or could this be a black swan well it's significant and I mean in Australia actually I mean well although not it can be seen as just uh, just another event yeah. But the attribution of climate change isn't there. We had huge floods in Brisbane, which, of course, and then there was a big fight about insurance. But there isn't, as in the US, government backing. Um, and so, uh, but there were fights about which place were on the flood maps and also some policies, well, some of the policies said, well, if it's damaged in a storm, uh, you get insurance. If it's damaged in a flood, well, you shouldn't have had your land on the flood plain, so you're out of luck. So there was a huge fight about that. Uh, which is still dragging on. But uh, what's come out of the fires is is at the likelihood that uh, rebuilding the houses that were destroyed in the fire is going to be massively more expensive and that potentially houses in the fire zone will either cease to be insurable or the insurance premiums will be at such a level where where uh, it may just not be cost-effective to um, uh, to build, build houses in those areas anymore. So, um, so we are facing that problem. Um, it depends partly, I think, on how 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 rapidly these things shift. So, if you look at the climate models, they say, well, in 80 years' time, uh, you know, the coastline is going to be you know, some significant distance inland from where it is now, maybe up to a kilometre. Um, if that happens one metre per year, very steadily over 100 years, that's fine. But if it happens when you have things build up and build up and people build seawalls and then we have one catastrophic event where the seawall is breached, which is, is very common, then we could have some really big shocks. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so so any one of these, I, I mean, I just... I, I, I mean, so what is, is your vision on... I mean, clearly climate change is going to continue to worsen. Uh, so, are, are are you willing to to put out any sort of timeline before this is really going to start dragging down uh, the the economy? Well, I, I mean, I think there's still time to turn it around. I mean, I think given um, 
uh, given a change of administration in the US at the end of the year and, and a, you know, a, shift, you know, a return to some kind of global leadership on these issues and, and a change in the attitudes of the Chinese government, which was until recently doing reasonably good stuff and isn't anymore, uh, we could drastically reduce emissions, slow down the pace of warming to a point where it will be manageable. Uh, I just don't, yeah, uh, 10 years ago I was confident that would happen. Uh, that hasn't been the case uh, <laughs> since then, but we could, we, yeah, we could collectively as a species solve this problem if we wanted to. So you you think so you don't think it's too late, but the but where where is the political will coming from? I I see it moving That's, in the opposite direction. Well, I think I think I mean I I'm yeah I obviously we remains to be seen you know how how the next best election will play out. But the U.S. of course is a huge deal because it's such a big share of the uh, uh, the world economy. Um, I was a big fan of the Green New Deal. Well, I guess at this stage, you know, the light the lineup looks more like, um, uh, as of yesterday, it looks more like Biden versus Trump. But even, even a, you know, I think a Biden presidency with a, a Democratic Congress would see uh, the, the restoration of momentum that's already taking place at the state level. Uh, we'd, we'd see, um, we'd see, I think, a, a big shift, which I think could could lead us back to the agreement for rapid decarbonisation, which was reached back in 2015. That's still doable. Uh, it's just a question of, of the politics of it. And, um, you know, I've been so bad at predicting you know, political outcomes anywhere that I'm not going to venture any out <laughs> any better as to how things will turn out uh, this come November. Yeah, well, I, I don't mind predicting. I think we've got four more years of, uh, of, of, of hell ahead of us. Uh, I, I, I think there's no one in this country uh, more than Donald Trump who, who wants uh, Joe Biden to be the Democratic nominee. But we don't we don't really get into uh, po politics that much on this channel. So uh, anyway, don't don't get set off on that reader. I mean, listener. I, I really don't get involved in the 2020 yeah. uh, political uh, thing here. So anyway, the, the bigger picture of this transition from fossil fuels. Now, you, you know better than I that the global industrial economy is, is I would say, 100% dependent on fossil fuels. I, I, I mean... Well, I mean, I suppose, I suppose I mean, historically it has been. I mean, this has been one of the best of good luck, though. We actually have, uh, have the technology uh, to... Uh, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Coal, in particular, is the worst of the fossil fuels, and we're already seeing lots of countries in Europe completely off coal or, or on the way, to, yeah, well, on the way to doing that. Well, uh, with the right effort, that's feasible everywhere. It, it's no longer, no longer the cheapest fuel. Lead, yeah, even disregarding all of its terrible effects. So, so we could get off fuel. We could get off coal. We could again with a big effort. Uh, switch from oil to uh, electric cars. Uh, it's just that um, it's not you know, it's not happening far. It's happening, but not fast enough. And we have powerful forces, uh, you know, the leaders of major governments, uh, really pushing against that, uh, pushing us in essence in the direction of the cliff. Pushing us in the direction of the cliff. Uh, yeah, but 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 you. You're you're still holding out uh, hope that that uh, the 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 fossil fuel economy, the, the people who control the the fossil fuel who control the tap are are going to be able to turn that tap off. I mean, it, it's completely contrary to uh, you know to their own success as as, as to their bottom line and to their shareholders. Uh, but but it well, I think, like I mean, hmm. you haven't abandoned hope yet. No, and I mean capitalism is a complicated thing. What you see is that uh, on the whole, and you know, contrary to the situation with the global financial crisis, you know, global finance on the whole is on the side of the angels here. The big financial companies are getting out, you know, getting out. They've already almost completely got out of coal. So that what you see is 
instead of coal being produced by mega corporations, global mega corporations, the only people still in the game are essentially uh, local crony capitalists, um, you know, people like Murray Cole in the US, uh, Adani in, in India and so forth. Uh, we have a bunch of them here in Australia. Uh, the big corporates can see the writing on the wall as far as coal is concerned. Uh, less so with, with oil, but even there, um, even there, I think uh, you have a company like Exxon, uh, which is pushing hard to go ahead with it, but they've gone from being the biggest company by global by capitalisation in the world or in the US uh, to, to edging out of the top 10 now because this is such a disaster. So I think there is still a chance. So I'm not optimistic we'll get that chance, but yeah, it, it's not. It's yeah, there are, it's not that uh, capitalism and the cap and the business class is uniformly behind fossil fuels. Uh, there's a big push in the opposite direction, uh, and and it could be successful. Okay, I will, uh, t t time, time will tell. Okay, I yeah. want to uh, go over to your website. John has, it's just straight johnquiggin.com where we yeah. can find a lot of stuff. You're, when you go on your page, the first uh, four words I read, now this is reposted from 2014, you ask the question, is global collapse imminent? So, um, well, what was your yes, answer in 2014, and what is your answer in 2020 to the to the question: Is global collapse imminent? Well, I mean, I was responding to somebody saying in 2014 it was imminent, and by imminent, they really meant within the next couple of years. Well, uh, obviously, global collapse hasn't happened, or you know, they've changed the meaning of the term. So, uh, so I guess I reached the conclusion: um, uh, collapse is a bit. Yeah. Uh, looking at that study, collapse was quite a bit further off than uh, uh, than uh, than the people who wrote that paper said. I, yeah, as I say, I think uh, not imminent and not inevitable, but still well and truly possible is my answer today. So, how were your feelings in 2020 compared to? Were, were you more likely in 2014? To think that global collapse was was imminent, uh, or do you think uh, it's more imminent uh, in 2020 than it was in 2014? Uh, on the whole, more. I think, I mean, all the political news in that time has been bad, pretty much. Uh, the one thing that's been good is that uh, a technology like uh, solar photovoltaics and wind has just powered ahead. Um, so that's been... Uh, that's been the good news of the past six years, but the developments uh, at the political level have been uh, have been mostly pretty terrible, and uh, that's true in Australia and in the US that that we have governments that are just determined determined to bring collapse about. Yeah, I mean, I've pointed out that people who are cheering, you know, so, some people uh, down in this rabbit hole are actually cheering on the collapse of global industrial civilization. Uh, and I say, well, if you're cheering on the collapse of global industrial civilization, I can't think of a better man than Donald Trump uh, to vote yeah. for. <laughs> so, now, yeah, I agree. There is certainly, <laughs> certainly I know, I mean, looking at Y2K and, yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a significant group at both ends of the political spectrum who want to see the whole system collapse, but there's also just a significant group who in some sense are just being frivolous and irresponsible, who'd rather give an up yours to the people they don't like, um, you know, that epic urban lefty or whoever it is, uh, than pull together and try and try and turn things around. And, and you know, the extent to which that, that kind of irresponsibility, uh, particularly on the part of the old, unfortunately. I mean, you would think old people are supposed to be, um, are supposed to be wise and thoughtful and care about, care about their grandchildren and so forth. It's, it's really, roughly speaking, uh, old white men who are the worst uh, worst offenders in this regard, who vote in the most um, and politically act in the most selfish and mean spirited and generally just irresponsible way. Which uh, is, is uh, since I suppose we are both in that category, that that is pretty depressing. Yeah, well, it's interesting. One, one of the one of the criticisms I get on my channel, and and it's usually coming from from myself is that my channel is the old white man uh, uh, the collapse chronicles that it's it's unbelievable 
what percentage uh, of the people, and, and it's simply, I, I, I'm really not sure why, John, that the, the vast majority of the people I end up interviewing are white men over the age of 50. Are, are, are yeah. the, uh, and yeah. I'm not sure why that is. Well, it's partly just that this is, you know, this is the society we live in, um, and um, uh, where you know, most, yeah, you know, in my academic department is a little bit more diverse than that, but not much more. Um, the positions of power and influence are held by people in our age group, and and most of them, most of them by people who more resemble. Uh, Donald Trump than Bernie Sanders, I guess. That's the problem. That, 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 that is a problem. So I, I just want to make it make sure for the record, you, I, I have never met an economist yet who said they are cheering on the collapse of global industrial civilization. Are you? No, no, I think, I mean, I think uh, people, who, people who think it might be a good thing haven't, you know, haven't, you know, look, look, you know, there are certainly people now, the paper you're referring to about the imminent collapse, they're looking back to a much simpler, happier life, uh, pre-industrial, uh, but not really dealing with the fact that that pre-industrial civilization supported something like 10% of the world's current population. So um, uh, we're not going to get to post-industrial civilization. Uh, if it happens, most of us aren't going to get there because that's, uh, um, uh, yeah, and... I guess uh, when I look at it, I imagine myself as being one of the people who isn't going to get there. So I, I can't say I, uh, I can't say I welcome that prospect at all. Well, it is going to be ugly. Don't don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, as uh, several of my guests have said, I don't know when it's going to collapse. But uh, it, it, as much as I cheer it on, I don't want to be there when it happens, and neither do you. It's it's going nah. to be it's going to be very ugly. I know how I sound when when I have a bad internet connection like you and I did last year, I mean last week, uh, that that puts me in a foul humor just when I get a poor internet connection. It's, it's going to be ugly. Um, mm. So we're talking about the, 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 the old farts like you and me, so talk about the, uh, the youngsters. Are, are you, a, I always ask my guests, uh, are, are you a father or, and or grandfather? A father and grandfather, and yeah, so I have a lot more hope for the younger generation. Yeah, uh, you know, I think the sooner that uh, the sooner that they push uh, the current political class off the, off the stage, the better. And um, I mean, you have actually, uh, you know, partly because this whole thing of neoliberalism happened in the last quarter, I guess, of last century. Um, you have really a whole lost generation. You can see this in the. Uh, you can see this in many respects in the Democratic Party. I don't want it back, but also in the you know, other political parties that you have a few really old guys like Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders who were around before uh, the party shift to the right. Uh, then you have a whole bunch of people who really are stuck in that pre-GFC, pre-climate change mode of thinking and can't get around it. And it's not till you get to people who are you know, well, well under 40 uh, that you start to get people who have a uh, rising through the political process who have a real appreciation of what's needed. But um, yeah, I think I look at I look at the younger people coming into politics, and I'm much more hopeful, and the yeah, younger activism, and just much more hopeful that uh, if if uh, if we can stave off collapse, I think they're going to do a much better job than the current cohort's done. So in your own personal life, uh, do you ever have this conversation with your children and grandchildren? Is it anywhere on their radar, or are they just going um, about their lives? Um, well, I mean, my grandchildren are still young enough that the last thing I want to do is tell them yeah, that's yeah. perhaps a global civilization, of course. Uh, uh, my son and I talk uh, a fair bit about these things, but um, uh, he's actually living in the U.S. at the moment in, in Atlanta, so, uh, uh, so we... Um, uh, we chat about about those kinds of things quite a bit, and and interact on you know, the blog and social media and that kind of stuff as well. So, it's uh, so we sort of talk about it. But I think, uh, well, uh, uh, this is my youngest son who's decided not to have any children. So I suppose he has a view on the matter. My my oldest son, um, uh, yeah, I talk a bit about, but we tend to tend to just uh, chat on about life in general. 
So your 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 youngest son who who has made the conscious decision not to have kids, he's more open to the discussion. I think so. I mean, he's got all sorts of reasons for not wanting children, but um, uh, um, uh, we sort of um, we sort of chat about all this stuff, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've, sometimes I really want to graph it out uh, to, to put the, the level of optimism about the future and thinking we can turn the train, the, this freight train around for people who do have children versus those who don't. And I've been, and I've had about 100 interviews. I really need to go through them and uh, mm. and, and graph this out. I, I wish I could figure out, you know, a way to you know, to literally graph: Do they have children, and how optimistic or pessimistic they are about the future, whether they do or don't? Now, I I have no children. I got a vasectomy when I was twenty two, mm. so I, I guess I can afford. To be a, a a little more pessimistic than, uh, than than people who do have kids. Yeah, no, that's possibly true. I suppose. Yeah, that's certainly um, certainly the whole issue. It's hard, you know, uh, hard to contemplate contemplate it with equanimity when uh, you know your own children or grandchildren are going to be affected. As I say, in Australia now that now that's already here, um, um, you know, I you know, I'm looking at uh, my own future. I'm in my 60s, but I could reasonably hope to live another 30 years. And and the way things are going, uh, some of those 30 years could be pretty miserable. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I, well I, I keep telling friends my age. I, I think that we are are, are going to make it out with the. With, I say with the screen door just hitting us on our own guilty asses yeah. on our way out, but. Uh, I, I'm glad I'm 60 and not and not 20 in the year 2020. So what? Uh, t- tell us about your future to wrap to, to start wrapping this up. What What do you see in, in in your? I guess you're getting ready to retire at some point soon. What are your plans? No, uh, yeah, I haven't. I I in those sort of things, I still haven't made my made my plans, and yeah, I guess I'm sort of. Still don't feel anything to what I did, so so yeah. At some point, I'll probably um, uh, kind of retire, but probably keep on doing more or the same things I'm doing, just without the stuff you have to do if you have a job. Uh, keep on banging on about climate change, for example. I can't imagine that uh, that's going to change. So just just I guess uh, uh, without having to do all the administration and general stuff you have to if you work at a university. That's um, uh, so probably sometime in the not too distant future I'll do that. But yeah, but basically I, I plan to carry on uh, pretty much as I am, just just possibly with the difference in employment status. Okay, well, not not many economists are even talking about climate change, so we do appreciate that. So any any advice for people listening to this who are who are starting to get depressed or anxious about what? About what's unfolding on the planet. What what is your what is your general advice to to folks about ham about how to handle the upcoming changes? Well, obviously, there's you know, there's uh, adjustments you can make in your own life, both both in terms of contributing less to the problems and also adapting to the you know, adapting to the fact that things will change. Uh, but I guess I'm. Basically, you know, lever in action at the political level. I mean, I know we don't want to talk politics, but really, that's uh, it. what we need to do: is get politicians into office who are willing to act, to do what's needed, and um, get the best we can. So, um, uh, unfortunately, we missed our chance in Australia last year. I hope that things will go a bit better in in the US in 2020. Yeah, I, I, were you surprised that the way that election turned out? I was. Uh, I, when I first heard the news, I was surprised for about three minutes, and then uh, after I gave it about three minutes of thought, I wasn't surprised at all. Were Were you taken aback? Oh, it was beautiful. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, because we had these opinion polls which consistently showed a very narrow win, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, because opinion polls, by their statistical nature, should bounce about. So there was obviously something going wrong there. 
and some bad radio, bad vibes were coming in the last few days. So it didn't come as a, a super shock to me. We had exit polls right on the day of the election, which actually said great Labor's winning the opposition party, but they turned out to be wrong. And so, so I wasn't super surprised, but I think a lot of people were. And the same with, I guess, uh, 2016. I mean, I read the numbers and they said, you know, 70, 30 for, for Hillary. And I said, yeah, I sort of think, well, 70% might be better better odds than 50, 50, 50, but it's, it's not a guaranteed win by any means. So, so things don't, I, I don't often get surprised by these outcomes anymore, I think. Well, of course, we live in a country where the, the, the person who gets the most votes uh, does not necessarily win. Indeed. <laughs> I, yes. I, I think New Zealand, isn't New Zealand the only other country other than the U.S. that has the, the system of voting where a, a person can get three million less votes than the other person and, and, uh, and still lose? New Zealand, is, New Zealand actually has a very good system, so theirs is, uh, theirs is, is actually very good. I mean, the, but the U.K. is another place where... Um, uh, where it's easy, you know, it's easy depending on how the vote is laid out. For some, you know, I mean, for uh, one party to get more votes and the other party to win, and uh, so um, uh, you know, the US and, and and the same in Canada actually. All these countries have this so-called this plurality system where if there's three candidates, even if far less than half of people vote for them, uh, the one who gets the most votes wins, and then the one who gets more votes than the others wins, even if even if each of the others you know, say uh, Warren and Sanders, they'd prefer it, prefer each other. Uh, that creates chaos, and then there's multiple layers with things like the electoral system, uh, the electoral college system, which is that kind of system. So, all the all the countries that basically followed England uh, in developing their electoral systems have that problem. Australia, and New Zealand have done more to fix it than most of the others, but the US, Canada, UK. You can really have easily have a situation where you have a government that sixty percent of the people hate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, as I say, I'm afraid we're we're heading into another four years of it. And John Quiggan, this is uh, I am thoroughly enjoying this conversation, but my battery uh, is warning me that global industrial civilization is uh, going to collapse again on us, like it did last year. Guys, this is the second time. Uh, we, we've tried to have this conversation. So, as I do always to wrap up these conversations, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, where you had close to an hour to, to mm. pontificate, but you actually had the New York Times calling you up, and you had the mainstream media calling you up and saying, John Quiggan, you have 60 seconds to give your message to the planet in the early days of 2020, what would your message to humanity sound bite sound like? Well, I was just actually asked this yesterday at a writers' festival, so I can give the answer. All in right. Three, so the three points are uh, uh, decarbonise electricity supply and then electrify everything. So decarbonise the economy, stop climate change as fast as as fast as we can. I think uh, take advantage of technological progress to free us up to work less rather than just accumulate more material goods. And as I said, the third one is the beauty contest answer, world peace. So there's a huge amount of resources just chewed up uh, in totally pointless activity, uh, uh, essentially military activity, which very rarely achieves what its proponents want and causes not only immediate death and destruction, but a huge waste of resources. Uh, that could be used to help save the planet. So that's my 60-second pitch. There you go. So uh, that, that that was a fine 60-second wrap-up. I'm sure we can just uh, tick all of those off the list uh, in, the, in the next week. So that is our challenge for the so. 21st century, what you just said there. So stick around, John, after after we wrap up. But uh, I've got to wrap this up before this battery shuts down again. So... Guys, uh, if you enjoyed what John Quiggan has had to share with us, please take a few moments to upvote this video. 
if uh, this podcast, I guess I should say in this case, and if you did not like what John Quiggan had to tell you uh, about what's unfolding in the 21st century, take a few seconds to thumb it down and tell us why you did that. And by all means, when you're over here, do take a few seconds to subscribe to Collapse Chronicles for more of these interviews with conversations with folks from up and down the spectrum. And John Quiggan, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy schedule to visit with us at Collapse Chronicles and most importantly, keep up the good fight. Thank you. Bye, guys.